Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Covenant Security Solutions Learn at Lunch webinar series. We are in for a treat today. My mentor, Dr. Ernest McDuffie, founder of the Global McDuffie Group, is online to enlighten us on global cyberspace needs, awareness, education, training, workforce development, and global internet policy. Thank you for your time today, Ernest. Your thought leadership on a global level has better prepared me to have an appreciation for cyber awareness, education, and training. I've been fortunate enough to have your mentorship along with John McCarthy during my Syracuse days, Dr. Bob Childs at the War College, Dr. Diana Burley during my transition to education and training. But you transitioned from this where I participate in a couple of working groups. Hey, McKella, I can't thank you enough for my mentors and, and for helping me to shape my career path. I'm really excited about the launch of TGMG. Can you tell us more about it? Absolutely. Uh, first, I just wanted to thank you uh, for the uh, opportunity uh, to talk to your audience. And certainly, I sent out a couple of uh, invitations of my own to this uh, session. It's a, it's a new endeavor. It's, a, it's exciting times, really, uh, for me personally and professionally uh, to kind of take everything that I've learned particularly over the last 15 years or so working in uh, the cybersecurity space and uh, taking it to the private sector and seeing um, you know what I can do uh, you know in terms of, uh, of my knowledge and uh, experience uh, sharing that with the, with the rest of the world so it's really been uh, an exciting opportunity for me uh, what, what I'm what uh, the the group is really all about is trying to take of uh, the connections, the people that I've met, the organizations such as uh, uh, Covenant and, and others that are working in this area, and uh, bringing them together uh, when opportunities present themselves that are bigger than uh, any single entity that can take on uh, alone, and form the kind of partnerships and coalitions that will really uh, allow us to move the needle forward uh, to tackle the big problems that are out there and uh, really to be of service to our, our customers uh, globally. Uh, so I, I think with that, I'm going to dive right in uh, to this presentation and kind of tell everybody what, what my thoughts are in this, uh, in this arena and where, where I see things going. So I, I think as everybody is pretty much aware, cyberspace is uh, really a global environment. and It affects uh, society at multiple levels, virtually every aspect of the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis has some impact or some relationship of the things happening in cyberspace. When you look around the globe, uh, certainly there are, are parts of the world that are still developing, underdeveloped countries, but even there, uh, the technology is, uh, is really becoming evident. Uh, places like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where you wouldn't think that they would be very much uh, technologically involved because of um, smartphones and um, uh, telecommunications, uh, they're really kind of leapfrogging uh, through the kind of uh, uh, space that uh, the industrial societies took by wiring their whole environment and, and having that kind of wired uh, um, thing happen first. Well, you're not going to wire the jungle. Uh, so technology is advanced. So you have satellite communication and, and uh, hotspots and all kinds of uh, uh, ways to connect people now. Uh, with the Internet of Things coming on board, uh, devices that we really didn't think about as being part of the Internet or part of cyberspace are now uh, coming on board at a, a tremendous uh, uh, pace. Uh, there's some estimates that something like um, 6 billion uh, devices will be uh, connected to the Internet. The same, almost as many devices as there are people on the planet will be uh, connected to the Internet uh, within the next few years, very, uh, very uh, close around the corner. With all this connectivity, you know, comes uh, uh, certainly lots of flexibility, uh, lots of opportunity to do good things, uh, but threats are also uh, part of those spaces. Uh, those of us who have uh, done any type of software development, uh, engineering, understand the, the intersection between physical systems and cyber systems. A relatively new term is out there now called cyber physical systems, where there's actual uh, research that's being gone, going on in, in how those types of systems interact with each other, 
and how we as human beings interact with them as well. A real good example of a cyber physical system, something very uh, common to all of us, uh, certainly all of us here in the United States and uh, globally, is the automobile. The modern automobile now, I was at a conference a few years ago in Detroit where all the major automobile makers were present, and they were indicating then, and remember this is a couple of years back now, maybe three or four years ago, even at that point, there were some 40 different processes in the typical new car and some 8 million lines of source code uh, running the different systems within those uh, vehicles. So huge, uh, huge amount of dependency on software development and, and the things being uh, done right. And as we move forward, uh, cars are becoming uh, autonomous. Uh, we have uh, smart highways on the horizon where the cars will be talking to each other, will be talking to the road, be increasing the safety capabilities, but at the same time, the threat space will go up as well if we don't pay attention uh, to what the uh, cybersecurity capabilities are. So that's just one very small aspect you have, uh, as the Department of Homeland Security will point out, here in the United States, we've identified some 16 different critical infrastructures uh, within the country that all have uh, cybersecurity uh, dependent uh, components to them. Uh, so much so that they uh, recently, a few years ago, stood up a cross-sector group uh, specifically to look at the cybersecurity issues across all 16 of those critical infrastructures uh, so that each one of those sectors wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel about cyber uh, security each time. They, they have this group now that looks at it across the board because so many of the issues are the same issues, just different platforms, uh, different sets of codes, different sets of uh, cyber physical systems to, uh, to deal with. So it really is everywhere and really is uh, critically important not only from a national security standpoint, but from an economic standpoint and how we continue uh, to develop world economies and the dependence on a knowledge-based system. So let me move forward a little bit uh, with my presentation here. I want to uh, keep track of the time. So you know, awareness is kind of like the first step. Uh, we have to have a general awareness, and this is you know for the entire population. I'm not talking about uh, cybersecurity professionals or people who are actually working in the field. Certainly, they are already aware and, and will have heightened awareness of all the things that I'm talking about. But it's important for the everyday citizen, uh, citizen of the 21st century. Uh, the world is getting uh, smaller and smaller, shrinking because of the World Wide Web and the Internet and all the, uh, the things that that brings to the table in terms of being aware of things happening globally and uh, also the threats that that brings right into your home, uh, the bad actors that are out there that can reach out and, and touch you in ways that they could never do before. It really brings to the table the importance of uh, understanding what it means to practice proper cyber hygiene. It's uh, really equivalent to the same thing that we do when we're faced with them. Uh, uh, flu ep epidemics and uh, diseases, uh, washing your hand, coughing into your elbow, uh, those kind of uh, proper hygiene things. Uh, certain um, have a, a equivalents that apply in cyberspace as well. Strong passwords, you know, looking out for phishing attacks, being aware of what the current threat space uh, looks like uh, out there, and how you uh, what you can do uh, to mitigate. Uh, your vulnerability to those, those threats is really important across the board. So the whole society uh, needs to be aware of these things so that they are able to function uh, in this um, kind of hostile environment uh, in a lot of cases and still be able to get the things done that they need to have done. Um, it really it really is uh, not, it's, 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 it's a cliche almost, but the weakest link is always going to be that human element in these uh, cyber physical systems. So it really behooves all of us to be aware, no matter what sector you're working in or what kind of job you have. Uh, certainly, if there's a computer on your desk and you've got internet access at your desk at work, um, you're you're really a, a player in this whole uh, area of uh, cyber security, cyber hygiene, not only for your company uh, but in your personal life. Um, Identity theft is a, is a real issue, a billion dollar business. So, uh, what happens when you go to your ATM, how you interact with your bank and your finances, even um, getting a direct deposit back uh, or from income tax returns and things like that. There are new scams out there all the time 
uh, where people are taking advantage of those uh, those threat vectors out there. So the more that we know about that, knowledge is really our uh, power, and it allows us to mitigate the uh, uh, level of vulnerability we have to continue to function. This certainly, uh, the education piece uh, goes hand in hand. As we uh, look at this generation of uh, young people that are in school now, that are, have grown up with the Internet, uh, it becomes second nature to them uh, to, to interact with uh, the uh, social media, uh, to have uh, smartphones, to, to be online, to have Facebook accounts, and Twitter accounts, and Instagram. It really is a, a part of everyday life for them. So that even uh, speaks more to the need not only for the awareness and the, and, the, and the cyber hygiene, but as they get sophisticated and they're moving through uh, uh, their educational uh, career, it's something that uh, people need to look at as potential career opportunities. Um, the uh, society in general is moving toward more and more to be a knowledge-based economy, uh, having training and skill sets that are at the fundamental enabling level of all of those activities is a great way to ensure that you're going to have a profitable you know, career as you move forward through uh, your academic career. Now, it's not that everybody needs to go out and get a, a degree in computer science and, and you know, be a hardcore cybersecurity warrior. Uh, there are all types of uh, different uh, jobs and careers that relate to of the cybersecurity space. If you're uh, interested in STEM in general, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, any of those disciplines uh, that relate uh, within that really broad definition, you'll find that there's a component that will touch on cybersecurity. Uh, in a real sense, the underlying enabler of the entire STEM enterprise is cybersecurity because you have to have computers nowadays to do uh, virtually any type of science, any type of engineering, any type of mathematics uh, at some level is going to require you to be uh, computer literate, uh, to exchange information over the internet, uh, to, to do experiments online. And so uh, having those systems secure and reliable means that you can do your work uh, better. You can uh, advance the things that you're uh, doing in the, in the mainframe. Uh, so uh, uh, to the extent that you're aware of what's happening in cybersecurity uh, aspects, it really goes hand in hand uh, with that. For those people who are interested in a career in cybersecurity, uh, certainly the kind of uh, ultimate goal for you is to have a combination of hands-on training for operational skills and combine that with deep theoretical knowledge what computer systems actually do, how they work, uh, how you can uh, you know, reverse uh, malware, software engineering uh, tactics, and what, what's going on in the real world is all kinds of uh, levels uh, for you to get involved, whether you're going for a two-year community college degree, a certification uh, from one of the uh, great vendors out there at ISC Squared, EC Council, uh, CompTIA, there are a number of uh, certifying uh, bodies out there where you could get uh, really hands-on training. Or you're going through and getting a bachelor's degree or a master's or onto a PhD and you want to do research or, or teach at the collegiate level. There's a place for all of those, uh, those uh, expertise in the cybersecurity world. Uh, set aside the entire uh, federal government and the national security uh, uh, efforts. Uh, the, uh, we're, we're under a... Uh, uh, not only at, at the national security level, but in private industry as well, there are bad actors out there that are attempting to steal intellectual property, national security secrets, uh, identity theft. All of that stuff is going on out there. So because there's such a level of activity, there's a real demand uh, for trained uh, people to combat that and really uh, uh, work for the good guys and not be uh, drawn to the dark side of that. The global workforce demands to continue to increase. It's not like this is a, a United States problem or even a first world problem. Uh, we often talk about the first world, third world, developing countries, underdeveloped countries. Well, these issues go across the board, uh, regardless of the nature of uh, the environment or the society or the economic status that you may find yourself in right now. Uh, the future is going to be more and more 
uh, dependent on these types of uh, cyber physical systems. And so cybersecurity is going to be around uh, for uh, the foreseeable future for sure. And if you want to get a career that will allow you to work anywhere in the globe, uh, this is certainly the uh, career field to be in. Uh, not only anywhere in the world, but it would allow you to stay in your hometown as well. I mean, you don't have to come to Washington, D.C. to get a job. Uh, you don't have to go to some specific uh, sector of the planet. Every state, every city, every local government, state government, every small, medium, large corporation is going to have issues around cybersecurity and is going to need a trained workforce uh, to deal with that. My last uh, four years or so in federal government, I, I led the uh, National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, uh, the NICE Initiative, and one of the uh, products that we produced was the National Cybersecurity Workforce Framework. In this framework, we defined over 30 uh, specific functional skill sets, all uh, part of the cybersecurity landscape. Uh, this model was specifically uh, created uh, to, to speak to multiple sectors of society, not only uh, the governmental sector or the private industry sector and the academic sector, and all the different critical infrastructures that go across all of those with a common language that would allow people to talk about cybersecurity workforce in a way that would be relatable uh, not only for your industry but for the industries that uh, work for you up and down your supply chain, uh, for the academics that are feeding you with your new workforce. So that when you speak about these 30 different functional skill sets, this language that this framework uh, puts forward will be something that will be recognizable across those broad sectors. So because of that, it becomes very valuable uh, to have people speaking the same language so you can compare apples to apples when you're trying to decide uh, what type of individuals you need in your workforce, what does your company need in terms of skill sets to uh, protect the information that's in uh, your company, and how you can uh, uh, take care of the care and feeding of that workforce. As you might imagine, uh, individuals in this workforce that are well-trained and have good experience are in high demand and are, are really uh, can write their own ticket uh, pretty much across uh, industry, private sector, government and academia, lots of opportunities out there for really profitable work. So it's a good field to go into, a good area to explore, and I certainly, if you go to the, uh, the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, website for NICE, you can find uh, reference material for that framework. It's all uh, freely available, downloadable, and all of that. Um, one of the other aspects uh, that I think uh, people tend to, under, to overlook a, a great deal is the fact that uh, it's really a global issue. And these uh, policy issues around the Internet, uh, things like net neutrality, uh, things like uh, securing the uh, global supply chain, uh, become critically important. And it doesn't really matter whether you're a big international uh, corporation or a small mom and pop shop, uh, because of the uh, the uh, ubiquitous uh, uh, nature of cyber uh, cyber physical systems, uh, software applications, uh, you're seeing these uh, apps being written by just about everybody uh, available on your smartphones, uh, business applications that might be running your payroll. Uh, so you you have to be aware of where uh, the software is being developed. Uh, can you trust that the uh, uh, the things that it's advertised, the software package is advertised to do, are all the things that it's actually doing, that there are no hidden back doors and traps in there, that there are things called uh, bot debts that can take control of your systems uh, now, even without you knowing it, and steal information from your systems. So you have to be very uh, sophisticated to what you're doing there. And you have to pay attention to what's happening in the um, uh, legal space, uh, the people who are determining these internet policies, for us in the United States, uh, that becomes the uh, federal government. Uh, once you are your congressmen and your senators, what are their opinions about these uh, different policies? And uh, how do they affect you as a small business owner, medium-sized business owner? Uh, being aware of that and advocating for things that are going to help uh, protect you is the way that you engage uh, with these uh, kinds of uh, policy uh, impact 
uh, statements that are happening all the time. Uh, if you don't engage, you, you might find yourself being overwhelmed by things that you didn't even realize were coming down the pipe. Uh, a good example on this uh, last chart that I'm talking about here, the huge markets that are out there uh, around the globe. We think about the United States being the most dynamic uh, economy on the planet, which we are, uh, but we're only about 320 uh, million people, and uh, some subset of that are the numbers that are actually online and doing business in cyberspace. You look at an environment like uh, China, for example, they've already got 600 million people online now uh, doing that, so that's almost twice uh, the population of the United States alone in China. India, same thing, a huge uh, population. I think there's uh, something like 1.2 billion people in India now. They're rapidly developing uh, their e-commerce presence. Uh, APEC is the Asian Pacific Economic Council. It represents some uh, 20 countries around the Pacific Rim from uh, New Zealand, Australia, Vietnam, Singapore, South Korea, uh, Japan, the United States, Canada. Uh, it, it's amazing and amazingly uh, diverse and developing uh, economic uh, powerhouse, if you will. And uh, the only way that you're going to really have a handle on any of that is to be aware of how the Internet policies in the different countries are interacting with each other on a national uh, level. So a lot of talk recently between the United States and China, uh, concerns about uh, certainly national security issues, and, and also at the same time concerns about intellectual property uh, issues and, and how we uh, deal with each other in, in that space. So there are groups out there that are working on uh, bilateral agreements about between these two major economic powers. And the sense is that um, the, as the rest of the world watches uh, what's happening between these two major players, that the outcomes will be uh, duplicated. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're doing uh, the right things in terms of uh, what the science and technology will allow us to do, and then the idea of fair play and fair market access and securing the uh, global supply chain uh, become critical is issues. Uh, some uh, folks in China are advocating that they uh, uh, become a closed shop, that they uh, don't allow uh, the import of uh, technology, certain technologies, because they don't trust uh, what's uh, embedded in these uh, cyber physical systems. Well, of course, it's almost impossible uh, to do that and still be part of the international community because things are being developed and built on, in a global uh, manner. Uh, things, uh, companies, big companies have a uh, presence around the globe, and so it's very difficult to uh, uh, even determine sometimes where things are, are coming from and who's had a hand in that. Uh, so we're looking to, uh, you know, really develop uh, trust relationships between countries, uh, between businesses and entities to, to keep the flow of technology, the latest and greatest things that are coming out of uh, laboratories and academic institutions around the globe that are all striving for these technological solutions to heighten uh, the uh, overall security level of these systems globally uh, to make sure that that flow remains free and open and as transparent as possible. Of course, as I said at the beginning, uh, the, it's really not just the technological solution. The human element will always be involved, and that's, uh, in a real sense, the most difficult uh, aspect of the problem. Uh, certainly these technological issues are, are tremendous and growing and evolving every day, but the human element is something that's uh, a bit of mystery for us uh, since the beginning of time. You know, how do we get uh, human beings to play uh, nice with each other and, and when you involve these advancing technological systems it just uh, multiplies the uh, possible complications there. So we have to really pay attention to the multiple cultures involved globally, uh, the workforce, the nature of the workforce, the care and feeding of that workforce, combined with the technical uh, issues that are coming down the pike every day or changing every day and are really keeping us uh, to a, an ultimate challenge. So there, there's a lot there, a lot there that I've covered in a very uh, short period of time, but certainly 
there's a lot of uh, activities involved in that space. So the Global McDuffie Group is uh, here to help, uh, not only uh, with uh, consulting uh, about anything that I've, I've spoke about in these problems, but uh, also uh, help with the idea of forming partnerships uh, globally uh, between organizations that are looking to do um, the right things across the board in this space to, to help move the bar uh, forward for everybody. It's one of those instances where a rising tide actually raises the level for all the ships involved. And we, we definitely want to be a part of that. I think I've had some excellent experiences over the last 15 years for sure, and even uh, going back over my entire professional career, which spans some four decades now, uh, it's always been involved with uh, technology. I, I can remember uh, back when I first started um, uh, at the United States Military Academy at West Point in the early 70s, they had one of the first uh, time-sharing uh, computer systems. You can actually go to their laboratory and check out what amounted to a big typewriter and take it home to your, your dormitory room and plug your uh, phone into a cradle and, and in, interact with the big mainframes at the time. And that was uh, state of the art. Uh, well, that's gone a long way from where we are today. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, those of us who have been around, you remember the old uh, IBM punch cards and stacks and stacks of them and having to take them to a uh, you know, a computer center and then run your program overnight and hope that nothing went wrong. When you Don't make me date that. myself. <laughs> yeah, but all I can yeah. say is, wow. I mean, you gave us so much wonderful information. I really appreciate you sharing your insight. And you're just one of those thought leaders who look at people in the workforce and you appreciate their gifts, and you just really know what to do with it once you identify things. And your insight and thought leadership has really made a mark in helping shape today's cyber workforce. And I really look forward to TGMG doing great things and, and helping folks in shaping their career path. But I do have one question for you. Um, okay. What can I do to improve the care and feeding of the cybersecurity workforce more than, you know, other than what we're doing already with caters and our training and education division at Covenant? Um, what do you recommend? You know, it's an interesting problem, and, and there aren't any real uh, silver bullets. I think the first thing is to, to make sure that you know who those people are in your workforce. That, that framework that I mentioned allows a, a company to really identify to a very granular level who's doing what in terms of cybersecurity. And then it's a matter of uh, meeting uh, the demands. I mean, it used to be a person would graduate from college and get a good job and figure, I'm going to be with that company for the next 40 years, get my gold watch, and retire, and that's going to be it. But now the expectation is you're probably are going to see people changing careers, changing companies four, five, seven times over their uh, professional life. And so that's a real cost uh, for a company in terms of retraining and, and bringing people up to speed. So you, as a company, you want to try to minimize uh, the amount of uh, turnover that, that occurs. And that happens by, you know, having happy employees. So flexibility, I think, becomes a, a key aspect. Uh, telework, when available particularly those of us who are in the D.C. area here. We have a, a pretty major snow event last night, and I'm imagining that a lot of people are teleworking today. And I, I think that having those three things option, that option available is important. Um, child care, uh, embracing diversity, bringing uh, women into the workforce, uh, all of these things are, uh, are critically important. It's not so much uh, the dollars. I mean, certainly... Uh, uh, competitive uh, compensation is a part of it, uh, but you you get to a point, a lot of people do in their careers uh, sooner than later that the money is not the most important thing. You know, the quality of life around uh, your job becomes uh, a, at least equally important as you move forward. So uh, looking to those type of issues and finding creative ways to, uh, to uh, address that uh, become critically important. Well, again, I really want to thank you um, 
for helping me throughout my career, and I thank you for participating in this webinar today. I thank you for your continued mentorship for me, and I'm telling you folks, you need to reach out to this guy. He knows a lot. He knows his stuff. So feel free to give Dr. McDuffie a call at 240-499-5666 or contact him at the Global McDuffie Group. I wish you much continued success, sir, and thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today at the Covenant Security Solutions Learn at Lunch webinar series. I uh, look forward to uh, you guys logging in again uh, next month. Uh, check us out the third Tuesday of March. Have a great day. Thanks again. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.